Hello, what is going on, everyone? You are tuned in and listening to another episode of Doable Discipleship. We are the show that helps you grow, or in other words, uh, we are a show that helps deepen your faith in relationship with God. Really excited for today. We're going to continue our discussion with uh, race and the gospel, and we have another special guest. You've actually heard from her uh, you will be Actually, hearing her she for won't, her in a few yeah. weeks. <laughs> yeah, Actually, it's coming. Yeah, the other podcast is on a different schedule. Uh, we are joined today uh, by Sarah Cruz. She actually joined us uh, for our time season, but she's also uh, going to be joining us in this conversation. She uh, has an incredible perspective, is, has tons of wisdom, um, and I think she's going to be able to really bless you guys, encourage you, encourage you challenge you the whole nine. Um, So Sarah, we're so glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And as always, we are joined uh, by our wonderful host, Jason Wheeland, back from baby duty. You're so kind. Not in the house right now, though. Oh, maybe never in the house again for recording. (laughs) (laughs) Now with a baby and a two-year-old who wants constant attention. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. So Sarah, give us a a kind of a rundown on who Sarah Cruz is. Um, As we're going deeper into this discussion with race and the gospel, um, who are you? What's your ethnic makeup? Uh, Who is Sarah Cruz? Give us give us a snapshot of, of who you are. Uh, that's a very big question. So it is. I know. <laughs> I'll pick off the more straightforward question. Um, I am the happy product of a biracial marriage. So my mom is white. She's German, Irish, Scottish, and my dad is Mexican and indigenous. So our family is part of the Lipan Apache tribe. Um, so yeah, I'm mixed. So I have my mom's coloring. So I'm you know, white for all intents and purposes. Um, my brother is, has my dad's coloring. So my, my brother looks more Mexican. So we're kind of a, a mixed family. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's thank really you cool. for, thank you for that. Like I was saying before, actually we were gotten to get in chat a little bit before the show and I was saying, you don't have to give your full, you know, <laughs> ethnic 23 and me breakdown, but it is helpful. Um, I think when we're, having these discussions to understand, okay, who, who are we speaking to? Who's weighing in on this? Um, so again, I'm, I'm really excited for your perspectives. Yeah. Okay. So sl- let's get, I, I guess let's kind of jump into the deep end a little bit here. <laughs> so when did you first become aware of, of race, of different ethnicities, of what that all means, that, that not everybody has the same background and comes from different places. When did you first become aware of this idea? I think that's an interesting question. I think in terms of your own ethnic identity, I think it's a combination of what you see when you look in the mirror and then what you see when you're, you know, sitting around the family dinner table, Sure. if you're lucky enough to have that experience. So for me, looking in the mirror, I see light skin, light eyes, you know, brown hair. And I look around the dinner table and I see my mom who looks like me and I see my dad who doesn't look like me. So um, I think personally, there was, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, your family dynamic is kind of like the air you breathe, you don't really realize it. Um, But I think like the earliest sense of it was like, even as a kid, maybe in like junior high, um, you have to fill out these surveys about, you know, what's your your racial makeup. And it's so binary. It's like, you you know, check one, check one box. You're white or you're Mexican or you're whatever. And I always, you know, felt like, I don't know, I feel like that was my first sense of like, oh, there's, there's not a box for me. Um, and I think that it probably wasn't until high school that I was maybe more aware of ethnic and racial differences. Um, you know, and and even prejudice and, you know, who I hung out with and uh, what my family thought about who I hung out with. Hmm. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, And I, I I like this question because I think we all have a a story of when we first become aware that there are differences, ethnic differences with people. And, um, it, people really get lumped into what race are you? Like you're saying, like what you fill it out. Are you white? Are you black? Are you Hispanic? Um, I think now there's like Pacific Islander, but that's a fairly new. I think now they have some more for uh, 
biracial children, mixed children. Um, I can think even for myself, when I was maybe seven years old, um, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I was probably maybe one or there might have been another kid in my class who was, who was also black. Um, but we were riding home on the bus one day and, uh, I had this little school girl, school, school boy crush, crush, like a, you know, little crush. I'm in second grade. I think maybe, maybe third grade on this girl named Samantha. And she was a, a young white girl. And I, worked up my little courage to go to the back of the bus and tell her that I have a crush on her. So, you know, I work up my courage. I go back there. I said, Hey, Samantha, I have to tell you something. She's like, yeah, what? She was in my class and said, I I have a crush on you. Do you like me? Um, And she said, well, I do like you, but I like Ivan more. And I'm like, well, why why do you like Ivan more than me? And she said, well, because he's white and you're black. Um, And I was like, Oh, Oh, and that was my first time my eyes were open to, she actually said, he's like a cake and you're like a cupcake. And I said, well, why am I the cupcake? She said, well, because he's white and you're black. Um, and I remember that really removed the scales from my eyes because up until that point, you know, you're a kid, you go to school, you come home, you have fun, you do your work, you, you know, you're worried about recess and stuff at, at school. And it was kind of like, I knew that I looked different and I knew there was some other Asian kids in my class. So I knew that there was differences in people, but I didn't know that there was, there could be a hierarchy between what is considered normal or accepted. And then everybody else, um, mm-hmm. until that one bus ride. And that was my first experience of becoming aware of, Oh my gosh, there's a lot more to this than just, we, we look different in my young seven-year-old mind. Um, I'm still working out the cake and cupcake thing in my head. The cake's bigger. A cake is bigger. You no, know, the cupcake is small. The cup- okay. The, so it's, it's oh, kind of good. It's okay. But then the cake is, you get more I, of it. Got, oh, That's gotcha. what, I, okay. You know, I, I'm, I, I don't know where she is now. I, would, <laughs> I can't really email I'd her and ask her. I'd love to have her, her on to explain that. Yeah, I'm going to get me. her on the show. I'll get on Facebook and look for every and, Samantha and in Seattle, Washington. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she, maybe she could let us know. Um, but what I'm, what I'm curious about, Sarah, is um, – so a little backstory too. So before I started working at Saddleback, I had met Sarah previously um, at a creative conference that Saddleback put on and then at a uh, racial reconciliation kind of two day conference that a uh, previous church I was a part of uh, put on. And I remember I was already, I've already basically had accepted and I was already moving to California and we got coffee and I asked like, what, how did you even get into this? Like, what, what was your entry point? So I'm, I'm, I want you to share that with us. What, was there a moment for you as a Christian that you decided, okay, I'm taking, I'm going to take reconciliation very seriously. Um, or was it a slow burn? What was that process like for you? Yeah, for me, it was about, I think it's been about six years ago now. I was in a seminary class and um, we had to do a book report on one of like five books. And the book that I picked is called The Heart of Racial Justice by Brenda Salter McNeil. And mm-hmm. if I'm honest, I picked the book because I thought it would be easy because I thought I got it. You know, like, oh, I'm like, I'm from a multi ethnic family. Like, I got this. I'm just going to skate through and it'll be easy. Um, LOL, because that was what God used to, to awaken me, almost like my, <laughs> my arrogance and my ability to skate through school. Um, so I read the book in that, you know, she's explaining the history and the reality of racism in America. And I think that was the moment when the scales, you know, fell off of my eyes. Um, and I just realized, like, I thought I got it. And like a lot of majority culture, I thought we had already solved this in the civil rights era. Um, So I became aware. And then right after that uh, was when Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were both murdered um, by police officers. And that's when I pushed really quickly into um, like, I need to do something about this because I became aware. And then I saw not firsthand, but I saw, you know, with my eyes, how it was being expressed in the here and now. And really what spurred me to action is, you know, this is all happening. 
And I turned to my church to understand, you know, what do I do with this? What do you do with the grief and with the questions and all of that? And to be honest, at the time, the church was largely silent. Um, and so I realized, you know, if, if there's no place for me to process this, that means there's no place for people of color to process this. Um, so that's the point. I, I moved pretty quickly from awareness to um, to action because I realized that there was just a, this big hole of silence where there should be conversation and healing. Mm. So, so, so as you started to enter into this frame and you started to have these thought processes and these conversations and you start to look, where did you start? Like, what was that start of taking these, of, of, uh, of taking steps towards, like, how did you start moving forward, I should say? I think the biggest thing was just, you know, like the biggest posture, and I didn't get it right at first, but it's something I've learned, is to be in the posture of listening and learning. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started looking, like the first thing I did was, I had a, a friendship with a local pastor of a multi-ethnic church. Um, so I went to his church on a Sunday morning right after all this was happening because I wanted to be in a place where the conversation was happening in a Christ-centered way because I started going to protests and marches and they weren't connected to the local church. And so they were looking to purely to like to laws and legislation to solve this. And while I think that's important, if you don't have the heart and the mind of Christ in it, I don't think you're really going to achieve peace because you're not after a full embodiment of love. Um, so it was a lot of listening and learning, but through that local church, they had had this reconciliation workshop. Um, so I just attended, I didn't really know what I was signing up for, but it happened to be taught by a woman named Latasha Morrison, who at the time had this little, um, you know, organization that she was just starting up called Be the Bridge. And um, she was just giving a workshop. And fast forward, now Be the Bridge is literally a worldwide movement. And she's got a New York Times bestseller. Um, but that was the biggest, I feel like that was the moment when I landed on something that could help me kind of like go through the process. So really, it was just a lot of learning, a lot of searching, a lot of reading, a lot of listening. And then finding like a, a way to start walking it out um, personally. Yeah, it's almost like there's two two awakenings. Um, like one when you become aware of race and history in our country, um, but also what you were saying when you first started to like really get into it and take it seriously, and you want to take a step, you want to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you, you turn to the, you, to the church for answers, but the church is large, largely silent. Um, I think that's almost like the second awakening of, okay, I want the mind of Christ. What, what does God say about this? What does God's people say about this? What does the Bible say about this? Is this just a social issue or is this also a, a, a spiritual gospel issue. Um, and I can even think for myself, it was probably 20, um, 2013, I think, when it clicked for me of like, oh, wait a second, this is also God in the Bible. God has a lot to say about this. Yeah. Um, reconciliation is really uh, – not just a theme, but at the heart of the gospel, not just an add-on to. And um, we'll get into some of that later in a few a few episodes. But uh, th that was like another moment for me um, of scales falling from my eyes of I can care about this in a, in a spiritual Christ-centered way. Um, and this is also a part of my journey. This is also a part of my discipleship. It's not just a periphery thing that I should care about or I should think about, but no, God cares deeply about reconciliation and justice and peace, um, which I think is really beautiful, but that usually comes a lot later because I, and I think that's because there is a, um, because the church has largely been silent, 
there's so many other voices that are telling us, this is how you should think about this. A political party is most likely telling you, this is how you should think about this. Um, News stations, whatever it is, there's a lot of other voices saying, no, 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 let me disciple you and how you should think about this. And the church, I believe, has a lot of ground to take. And that's why I'm really excited that we're even doing this podcast. But there's so much to be said and there's so much to learn in it as well. And what I think about too, Sarah, is this. I, I think there's a, I, I don't know. I think there's a, there are a lot of people that go, okay, I, I really care, um, but I just have no clue what to do. I have no idea what should I say? Where should I go? What, what should I be doing? I don't know what to do. Um, so from your perspective, how would, what would you tell those people? What would you say, what would you say to them for those who care but don't know what to do yet? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing, there's a saying in like reconciliation work that if you're uncomfortable, you're doing it right. So, <laughs> the, you know, move towards the discomfort. It's not, it's not a sign that you're doing it wrong. It's actually a good sign. Um, and honestly, at this point, I think Be The Bridge as an organization is one of the most powerful tools for this work. And the beautiful thing is, you know, Unfortunately, it keeps taking these, um, you know, these murders for more and more people to come online, more and more people to be awakened. But no matter when you find yourself awake, the work has been going on for decades and decades. So the work is already there. The information is already there. You just have to find it. And Be The Bridge is honestly because it's been personally so powerful to me. Um, I joined the Facebook group. Now there's tens of thousands of people in that group, but um, they have all of these resources that they've already called. The beautiful thing is Latasha um, loves Jesus. May I add that she's a godly single woman who started a global movement. She did not wait for permission. She started it and it's a big thing. Um, (laughs) But they've, they've gathered all these resources so you can understand like, what is racism? What does that mean? What is ethnicity? What is reconciliation? Um, if you're white, they've actually developed resources so you can learn, um, so you can kind of get in that posture of listening and not centering yourself. Because you really do, like, the biggest thing, if you're not going to do the big, be the bridge, I think the biggest thing is to put yourself um, in a student listener role to somebody who is black, a black American who can teach you because you're learning from white people, you're, it's not the same thing. So personally, I would recommend Be The Bridge all day long because they've been doing this work for years. Um, Because it also Be The Bridge is basically, it's like a eight part curriculum and it's centered around a diverse people, a diverse group of people sit around the table and they talk through these issues together. So you decide that it's a safe group to work out all these conversations. You know, sometimes you're saying the wrong thing and it's, uh, you know, you've got other people that are saying, Hey, maybe that's not the way to phrase it. So you're able to work out reconciliation personally. It's almost like practicing reconciliation so that then you can go and be an agent of reconciliation out in the world around you. That is really beautiful. Two things I think that you said are, that were profound. Um, you're going to be uncomfortable. Yep. And it, it's okay. Uh, there's really no, um, with as much history as we have, there's really no sanitized, easy way to, to, to learn and go through it. There's going to be difficult spots. There's going to be uncomfortable spots. Um, and, and that's just, that's a part of it. And, and that's okay. Uh, it, it is okay to be uncomfortable, but also what I heard you say is the importance of community. Mm-hmm. Um, that this is reconciliation is worked out amongst people. Um, you know, we've, we've talked in the past about vertical reconciliation or vertically reconciled to God, but because of that in, in second Corinthians five, Paul talks about that we've also been given the ministry of reconciliation. So there's a horizontal reconciliation piece as well. So it's not just reconciled to God, but because we've been reconciled to God, it empowers us to be reconciled to each other. And um, that can't happen apart from community. You, you, you have to be with other people. You have to be in community. Um, and what you said, you know, you practice that reconciliation with each other. 
Um, and maybe that's a better way to think about it, that reconciliation is a practice. It's something that you continue to come back to. It's something that you continue uh, to do. It's not just a, in, uh, an ultimate ar- arriving point. Uh, one day we know it will be, but until then we practice reconciliation. If we can be reconciled to, to each other, then we can model what that looks like to the rest of the world. We can model what that looks like to our communities and families and schools and wherever, I don't know, wherever we, we may find ourselves. Um, but uncomfortable, being uncomfortable is a part of it. And you got to be in community. You got to be with other people. Yeah. I think, so important. Yeah. I think that kind of is one of the hallmarks of listening and learning, right? Is in what you were talking about is, is, is really what you're doing when you are taking the time to listen and learn from be it one person at a time or a couple of different people is you are deepening your fellowship with them is you are having those conversations and you know, and just saying, I want to, I, I want to invest my time by listening to what you have to, to say, I want to learn more about your experience. I want to hear it in your words, because when you're talking about um, advocacy and when you're talking about um, reconciliation, is you want to hear it in the words that they are using, and you want to hear it in the way that they are talking about it and not just kind of hearing kind of these broad terms from a Brandon, like what you were saying from organizations or political parties or news that, you know, groups or whatever that are used is, is no, you want to hear it from the ground level and just go yeah. and talk with individuals because sometimes you know, what is actually being thought or what is actually being said doesn't trickle to the top. (laughs) It doesn't make its way up to the loud megaphone. So you want to hear it from the people who are actually living it and experiencing it. And I think that's what's been, and like what you said, Sarah, is, is it's, it's tragic that it takes tragic circumstances to bring people to a posture of listening and learning but um but the fact of the matter is 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 that we're here now and so i think um i think something that you started engaging in six years ago is where a lot of people are just stepping into now right um so for those people who are are taking those steps now i'm just curious like how has how has this advocacy and everything that that you've been stepping into um in the last six years how has this been a part of your discipleship journey you know this doable discipleship and um assumingly a, a lot most of the people that are listening to this are disciples um or believers, and for those of you who are listening, who are just stepping into this now, I think it's a good question to talk to somebody who's been involved in it for the last six years, and just you know, to get kind of a sense: how has this affected your journey? How has this become a part of your journey of discipleship, and what does that marriage look like? Yeah, I mean, I didn't go into it with the the thought of, you know, how is this going to grow me or form me, but... I and yet it did. <laughs> it did, 100% did. <laughs> um, but I think you can tell something is near the heart of God when your pursuit of it brings you personally to more wholeness and fullness. And I think that's the, like, unintended, you know, side benefit that I never saw coming is that you know, I wasn't focused on myself. I was focused on there is a part of the body of Christ that is hurting and I have been unaware to it. So really focused there. But as I did being in the growing and the wrestling and all of that, um, you know, I asked the questions like Brandon, like you were saying, like, what is God's design for ethnicity? I have to believe that he chose us all 
to be in the families of origin that we are from and that he, you know, painted our skin and our hair and our bodies like a particular way and found joy in that. So what does this mean? And as I explore that naturally, and I hope this is true for everybody in this work, you look at yourself because everybody has an ethnicity. Just because you're white doesn't mean you're not ethnic. You've got ethnicity. And so what is God, like, how do you hold it in the right place? You don't put it into this, you know, you don't put it on a pedestal. Um, you put it in its right place. And so I think for me, um, it's really brought me to more fullness, a more full understanding of how God created me. Um, I actually have more embraced my, my father's culture and my father's ethnicity. Um, so that's been really beautiful. And then I think, you know, being willing to be uncomfortable, um, having to press into conversations I didn't want to have to, to ask myself, am I willing to be brave and speak truth to power? Am I willing to, you know, stand up and be that girl who, you know, is going to point out the ignorant things that people are saying, because there's a lot of, I'll just say, I think in America, our, our Christianity has a lot to do with comfort. We put comfort on a pedestal and the work of reconciliation for sure will, will smash that. It's not about comfort. And so I really had to, to come up to my own um, desire to, to people please or to avoid hard conversations um, and to press into that and to lean on God to help me have the right words. I'm just like, I don't love conflict and I don't always feel like I'm the best at, you know, saying the hard things, but I feel like pressing into that God has um, strengthened me and that strength actually now shows itself throughout my life. Um, but it's not like personal strength. It's like leaning on God. Um, I, I love this. I'm in this um, class in seminary and, and it's on the ethics and theology of Martin Luther King Jr., which I'm like, super into right now. Um, and there's this quote uh, that I read last night and it says, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. And I think like pursuing that work has changed my faith and my spirituality and my maturity in ways um, that I'm just incredibly grateful for. That's really, that's really well said. Um, that's yeah. I'm kind of just chewing on on that quote which you just said. Um, one of the things I I want to touch on just briefly, uh, as you're speaking, you 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 mentioned it, this work, this ministry of reconciliation, or this work of rec- reconciliation, has caused you to look inward, but also has allowed you to connect with your dad's side, mm-hmm. with your Mexican roots. With uh, I think it was Lip Lipon Apache. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got it. But that's, but that's really cool. And it, it, it just made me think of, uh, again, Jesus' words and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm-hmm. And the second is like it, to, to love your neighbor as yourself and the yourself part. Loving, what does it look like to love ourselves well? And I think a part of that, um, not the whole, but I think a major part of loving ourselves well is to to love who God made us mm. to, to love. Like you said, it's, he, he created us in joy. Um, I like to say it's all of God's wisdom and creativity went into creating us mm. humans, his people. Um, and that comes down to how much melanin people have in their skin, the curl pattern of their hair, um, all of it that God is creating and going, yes, this is good. This is exactly what I wanted. This is exactly what I had in mind. Um, all the different ethnic features that we see, um, God saw it, God created it and God called it good. Mm-hmm. And, um, a, I think a large part of that is being able to look in the mirror and say, what God created here is good. Mm-hmm. This is, this was God's design. This is what God intended. Um, and this is how I'm going to love myself well. Uh, a part of part of that work of loving myself. Um, so yeah, just just a few thoughts there. Um, but I, I I really liked how you 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 wrapped that up, Sarah. That that was really well done, Jason. Um, any final closing thoughts for us? Um, I just I, I, it's something that we've talked about in this series before, but 
um, Sarah, what you were saying about um, how there's a whole population within the body of Christ that's hurting. I think that's something that um, should, if if you are listening, and that's not something that, that you had thought about before, I'm hoping that that kind of hits you in the chest a little bit. Um, just to be more aware or mindful of people other than yourself within the body. And, you know, the Bible talks a lot about like knowing the state of your flock. And it talks about, um, Brandon, what you were just talking about with loving your neighbor as yourself, and it talks about burden sharing, and there's a whole it's the the, the the talks a lot about what it's like to truly live in community and, and, and truly live in the way that you are caring for others, and you can't do that if you aren't stepping in and asking the uncomfortable questions that you were talking about. It's okay to ask. How are you doing? It's okay to ask, are there pain points going on? Or even even more so, it's okay to just listen to what other people and truly listen to what other people are saying. I think a lot of times um, a person can be telling you about something in their life and even be talking about pain points and it can go completely over our heads or just right past us um, either because we are naive in what they're talking about or or just ignorant and not knowing like whether it's a history thing or whether it's an ongoing cultural or racial thing sometimes if we're not aware it can just go right past us um so i think i think right now what's so great about the conversation that we're able to have now is this emphasis on truly listening which is not just hearing but listening Uh, emphasis on asking questions and learning and wanting to dive deeper with people and get, get into the things that they are thinking about or the things that, that they are sad about or cry about or, or pain or or, or feel pain points in even just the way that, that people or groups of people or, or populations of people have to, act or think differently than you might. That's, that's something that is important to, to learn just so you can be aware of the experiences that others are having and that you can be in connection and closeness and fellowship and love with them in it and through it. So I think, I think a good litmus test for whether or not you've been a good listener in this space is, first of all, if you don't have any black friends, that (laughs) that's a problem um but if you do if you're in community if you're in proximity to african americans and they have not shared their story with you you probably aren't considered a safe person and you probably haven't done the work to be able to hold space or to listen well to people and so i think that's it's so key what you're saying is to be able to listen and nobody should have to justify their pain to you And if you're one of those people that says, you know, I get it, I understand, I know how you feel, I think in this conversation, those are really good phrases to remove from your vernacular. I think it's better to say, I hear you, you know, to acknowledge the story. But I think listening and listening well is so, so key. Yeah. And don't assume that you know. And and don't, and don't, don't go in with a mindset that, oh, you know, oh, I'm, I, you know, I bet this person's experience is just, it's just one experience, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's not, um, it's not a, a whole issue or it's not broader or, or, or don't belittle their a person's feelings or a person's experience. Yeah, I think, I think that's something that that sometimes we can find ourselves in because we don't want to face the uncomfortable thing mm-hmm. is to just, you know, say like, like, Oh, I'm not like, I'm sorry that happened to you and then move, it, it, you know, it, and then it's done with in your mind, you know, you just move on or whatever. Or, uh, but instead like, 
it's it's about it's it's knowing that this person's experience is genuine and it's their experience and then if you as you talk to other people you can start to hear that it's more common than you may have even realized Mm -hmm. um or, or that it's more that it's that it it reflects more about um modern times than you may have even thought so i think um yeah don't just literally shut up and listen <laughs> and then and then and then be with them for be for them uh, we're reading a book right now in our team and we were just reading this chapter and we talked about this in our, our team meeting on monday um is a chapter on on how love works and it was talking about being um with for and unto right brandon i got those right yep that's it <laughs> Yeah. And, um, and I, I think if you think about truly what it means to love others, it means being with them. It means being for them and it means being unto them. Um, and so I, I just, I think what most excites me about all the conversations that we're able to have now is this idea of deepening love for each other. Ultimately, that's the root of what we're getting at is, is deepening love for God and understanding of, of God and deepening love for each other and understanding each other better. Awesome. Brandon, um, tie us up. Tie us up. Well, in the spirit of that. Bring us home. <laughs> in, 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 the, in the spirit of that, I think this is our doable. Um, I don't think we've done a doable quite like this, but this is, this is the doable. Go to a mirror, right? So part of your, your, your morning routine, you get up, you brush your teeth, you do all, do all that stuff. Look in the mirror and kind of just take inventory, bone structure, skin color, hair texture, nose, eyes, lips, and say this, all of these things are God dreamed. All of these things are God created. And this is the wisdom and creativity of God. And I think in doing that and celebrating who God created you to be and celebrating what God has given you, it will become easier to celebrate that in others and celebrating what God's given you and recognizing that it is truly God's work. Um, and it's like Sarah said, God created in joy. That is truly God's work. When you can see that in yourself, when you can recognize that in yourself, not, not as a practice of vanity, but in celebrating what God has created, who God has created you to be, I think it becomes easier for you then to see other people and, and recognize and see and celebrate the image of God in them as well. So next time you're in the mirror, go ahead and give that a run through. Go ahead and practice that. Uh, and I think that we will be better for it. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us again on the show. Yeah. Just so you guys are aware, we will also have Sarah. She's going to be coming up in, I think, two weeks um, mm-hmm. on our Tuesday time releases, our, our time uh, season. So she's uh, definitely given us a lot of, a lot of wisdom, um, brought great perspective to the Doable Discipleship podcast especially this month. So Sarah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, with that, I think it's time to sign off. We will see you soon. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Mm-hmm.